Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It Book by William Walker Atkinson Narrated by Andrew Originally published in 1909 This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 10 Training the Ear The sense of hearing is one of the highest of the senses or channels whereby we receive impressions from the outside world. In fact, it ranks almost as high as the sense of sight. In the senses of taste, touch, and smell there is a direct contact between the sensitive recipient nerve substance and the particles of the object sensed. While in the sense of sight and the sense of hearing the impression is received through the medium of waves in the ether. Or waves in the air moreover in taste, smell and touch the object sensed are brought into direct contact with the terminal nerve apparatus. While in seeing and hearing the nerves terminate in peculiar and delicate sacs which contain a fluidic substance through which the impression is conveyed to the nerve proper. Loss of this fluidic substance destroys the faculty to receive impressions, and deafness or blindness ensues. As Foster says, waves of sound falling upon the auditory nerve itself produces no effect whatever. It is only when, by the medium of the endolymph, they are brought to bear on the delicate and peculiar epithelium cells which constitute the peripheral terminations of the nerve. That sensations of sound arise. Just as it is true that it is the mind and not the eye that really sees, so is it true that it is the mind and not the ear that really hears. Many sounds reach the ear that are not registered by the mind. We pass along a crowded street, the waves of many sounds reaching the nerves of the ear, and yet the mind accepts the sounds of but few things particularly when the novelty of the sounds has passed away. It is a matter of interest and attention in this case, as well as in the case of hearing. As Halleck says, if we sit by an open window in the country on a summer day, we may have many stimuli knocking at the gate of attention. The ticking of a clock, the sound of the wind, the cackling of fowl, the quacking of ducks, the barking of dogs, the lowing of cows, the cries of children at play, the rustling of leaves. The songs of birds, the rumbling of wagons, etc. If attention is centered upon any one of these, that for the time being acquires the importance of a king upon the throne of our mental world. Many persons complain of not being able to remember sounds, or things reaching the mind through the sense of hearing, and attribute the trouble to some defect in the organs of hearing. But in so doing they overlook the real cause of the trouble. For it is a scientific fact that many of such persons are found to have hearing apparatus perfectly developed and in the best working order, their trouble arising from a lack of training of the mental faculty of hearing. In other words, the trouble is in their mind instead of in the organs of hearing. To acquire the faculty of correct hearing and correct memory of things heard, the mental faculty of hearing must be exercised, trained, and developed. Given a number of people whose hearing apparatus are equally perfect, we will find that some hear much better than others, and some hear certain things better than they do certain other things. And that there is a great difference in the grades and degrees of memory of the things heard. As Kay says, great differences exist among individuals with regard to the acuteness of this sense, and some possess it in greater perfection in certain directions than in others. One whose hearing is good for sound in general may yet have but little ear for musical tones. And, on the other hand, one with a good ear for music may yet be deficient as regards hearing in general. The secret of this is to be found in the degree of interest and attention bestowed upon the particular thing giving forth the sound. It is a fact that the mind will hear the faintest sounds from things in which is centered interest and attention, while at the same time ignoring things in which there is no interest and to which the attention is not turned. A sleeping mother will awaken at the slightest whimper from her babe, while the rumbling of a heavy wagon on the street, or even the discharge of a gun in the neighborhood may not be noticed by her. An engineer will detect the slightest difference in the whir or hum of his engine, while failing to notice a very loud noise outside. A musician will note the slightest discord occurring in a concert in which there are a great number of instruments being played, and in which there is a great volume of sound reaching the ear, while other sounds may be unheard by him. The man who taps the wheels of your railroad car is able to detect the slightest difference in tone and is thus informed that there is a crack or flaw in the wheel. One who handles large quantities of coin will have his attention drawn to the slightest difference in the ring of a piece of gold or silver. That informs him that there is something wrong with the coin. A train engineer will distinguish the strange were of something wrong with the train behind him 
amidst all the thundering rattle and roar in which it is merged. The foreman in a machine shop in the same manner detects the little strange noise that informs him that something is amiss, and he rings off the power at once. Telegraphers are able to detect the almost imperceptible differences in the sound of their instruments that inform them that a new operator is on the wire, or just who is sending the message. And, in some cases, the mood or temper of the person transmitting it. Train men and steamboat men recognize the differences between every engine or boat on their line, or river, as the case may be. A skilled physician will detect the faint sounds denoting a respiratory trouble or a heart murmur in the patients. And yet these very people who are able to detect the faint differences in sound, above mentioned, are often known as poor hearers and other things. Why? Simply because they hear only that in which they are interested and to which their attention has been directed. That is the whole secret, and in it is also to be found the secret of training of the ear perception. It is all a matter of interest and attention. The details depend upon these principles. In view of the facts just stated, it will be seen that the remedy for poor hearing and poor memory of things heard is to be found in the use of the will in the direction of voluntary attention and interest. So true is this that some authorities go so far as to claim that many cases of supposed slight deafness are really but the result of lack of attention and concentration on the part of the person so troubled. K says, what is commonly called deafness is not infrequently to be attributed to this cause. The sounds being heard but not being interpreted or recognized. Sounds may be distinctly heard when the attention is directed toward them, that in ordinary circumstances would be imperceptible. And people often fail to hear what is said to them because they are not paying attention. Harvey says that one half of the deafness that exists is the result of inattention cannot be doubted. There are but few persons who have not had the experience of listening to some bore whose words were distinctly heard but the meaning of which was entirely lost because of inattention and lack of interest. Kirk sums the matter up in these words. In hearing we must distinguish two different points, the audible sensation as it is developed without any intellectual interference, and the conception which we form in consequence of that sensation. The reason that many persons do not remember things that they have heard is simply because they have not listened properly. For listening is far more common than one would suppose at first. A little self-examination will reveal to you the fact that you have fallen into the bad habit of inattention. One cannot listen to everything, of course, it would not be advisable. But one should acquire the habit of either really listening or else refusing to listen at all. The compromise of careless listening brings about deplorable results and is really the reason why so many people can't remember what they have heard. It is all a matter of habit. Persons who have poor memories of ear impressions should begin to listen in earnest. In order to reacquire their lost habit of proper listening, they must exercise voluntary attention and develop interest. The following suggestions may be useful in that direction. Try to memorize words that are spoken to you in conversation, a few sentences, or even one, at a time. You will find that the effort made to fasten the sentence on your memory will result in a concentration of the attention on the words of the speaker. Do the same thing when you are listening to a preacher, actor, or lecturer. Pick out the first sentence for memorizing and make up your mind that your memory will be as wax to receive the impression and as steel to retain it. Listen to the stray scraps of conversation that come to your ears while walking on the street and endeavor to memorize a sentence or two, as if you were to repeat it later in the day. Study the various tones, expressions, and inflections in the voices of persons speaking to you. You will find this most interesting and helpful. You will be surprised at the details that such analysis will reveal. Listen to the footsteps of different persons and endeavor to distinguish between them. Each has its peculiarities. Get someone to read a line or two of poetry or prose to you, and then endeavor to remember it. A little practice of this kind will greatly develop the power of voluntary attention to sounds and spoken words. But above everything else, practice repeating the words and sounds that you have memorized so far as is possible, for by so doing you will get the mind into the habit of taking an interest in sound impressions. In this way you not only improve the sense of hearing, but also the faculty of remembering dot if you will analyze and boil down the above remarks and directions. You will find that the gist of the whole matter is that one should actually use, employ, and exercise the mental faculty of hearing, actively and intelligently. Nature has a way of putting to sleep, 
or atrophying any faculty that is not used or exercised. And also of encouraging, developing, and strengthening any faculty that is properly employed and exercised. In this you have the secret. Use it. If you will listen well, you will hear well and remember well that which you have heard. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.